My name's Adam, if I hadn't had a chance to meet you. Um, it is, uh, it's a good day. It's an interesting day, too, being uh, a Super Bowl Sunday. I think this is weird for me because this is the first in a while we're not experiencing, like, bandwagon fans because Rams fans and Bagels, Bengals fans are actually just getting used to being able to admit that they're actually fans of the Rams and the Bengals. So a bandwagon hasn't yet formed. Really? No, that's it? That was good. Come on. That's... <laughs> must, it's, thank you. There we go. Yep. Yes. Oh, man. Wow. We have a lot of work to do. All right. Well, we might as well get started in that work. Uh, we are... Um, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount together, and uh, we're making haste slowly through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we are still in Matthew chapter 5. We will be for, um, man, we're going to be in Matthew 5 for a little bit, but uh, we've seen so far, and we're going to see over the coming weeks that this teaching from Jesus is not a philosophical presentation of how to behave properly. It's an announcement of the inbreaking kingdom of God. Yeah, that's worth a who, who. We're not talking about general truth of life type stuff. It's, it's the part of the gospel of the kingdom of God that demonstrates the power of reconciliation. It's a sermon about the plan of God and evidence is the fact that God invites his creation into the story of redemptive love. And so as we've gone over the Beatitudes over the past several weeks, it's very easy to slide back into that place of, of, I need to be this, I need to do something, I need to work, I need to achieve. But as we move beyond the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, uh, 3 through 12, we need to bear in mind a couple of things. First, um, we need to remember that he's talking to his disciples, right? Uh, it, this is a crowd of those that want to hear Jesus and, and they, they want to accept what he has to offer. This crowd looks a lot like us. This is a crowd that heard the gospel. The sermon from Jesus is presented from the context of gospel. We spoke about this before. We spoke about how E. Stanley Jones points out that if we separate the message from the context of the Sermon on the Mount, these words, especially the Beatitude words, that are meant to give life become either frustrating idealism or oppressive legalism. Now, we use the word gospel to, to both describe the first four books of Scripture, of, of the New Testament Scripture, that define the, the life and ministry of, of Jesus, but we also um, use it in terms of the message that Jesus brought, the message of God's plan, the meta-narrative of God's plan that we see from the beginning, from creation, all the way through to, to the very end when we are with him. All of it starts with gospel, and all of the disciples, just like all of us, are brought here because we first heard the proclamation of the gospel. We see this in, in uh, Mark chapter 1. The time promised, this is Jesus speaking, the time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. This is a group of people that heard the good news and wanted to do something with it. So they are there on the mountain listening to Jesus as first being gospel hearers. They're just like us. Daryl Johnson says that the message Jesus brought is the explosive announcement that in him and because of him, the long-awaited kingdom of the living God is breaking into the world. Another quote that we used earlier as we started this, another one from G.K. Chesterton, said that, the, that on the first reading of the Sermon on the Mount, especially the pieces that we've just kind of journeyed through together, you feel like it turns everything upside down. But the second time we read it, we discover that it turns everything right side up. The first time it's read, you feel that it's impossible. 
the second time, you feel that nothing else is possible. And it's in this context, the context of gospel, of the good news of Jesus, that the impossibly possible words move out of this realm of, of frustrating idealism or oppressive legalism and into the realm of hope, hopeful expectation of a relationship with God. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is that the way that we approach the Beatitudes is the way that we also have to approach the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. The qualities that Jesus identified and blessed in those Beatitudes, uh, we have to remember these are not natural qualities that we can produce on our own. These qualities are a result of contact with Jesus. They're not metrics or outcomes that we can manipulate ourselves. It's a result of contact with Jesus. It's in this that the qualities that Jesus blesses emerge in our character. Contact with Jesus brings this out. This begins, though, when we, like the disciples that are sitting with Jesus on this mountain, it begins when we hear and respond to the gospel message, and it leads us to the process where then we reflect Jesus rather than reflect the culture around us. So with that in mind and with that framing where we're going today, let's, let's get moving. Sermon on the Mount, in, uh, starting in Matthew 5. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot. It's worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that your presence would be with us this morning as we unpack your message to us. I pray, Father, that we would see not a call to be worthy, I pray that we would see that you are worthy. I pray, Father, that as we look back over the journey that we've taken so far through your sermon, I pray that we wouldn't see a metric to attain. I pray that we would see the product of being next to you. And I pray from that place, Lord, you would speak to us today in Jesus' name. This next section that we just stepped into, coming out of the Beatitudes, this is about the power of the kingdom of God manifesting in the Beatituding person. Now, we got our theologians together this week trying to figure out how do we describe the Beatituding person. Speaking with Harlan and with Brad, we've coined the term term the Beatitude. The beatitude is the beatituding person, this kingdomized person, this person that through contact with Jesus begins to look like Jesus. This is the beatitude. This is the you that that begins verse 13. The you in verse 13 that we just read. We're not talking about a general you. 
We're talking about a very specific you. The you that Jesus is talking about in verse 13 as he begins verse 13 is the beatitude. Jesus shows the true meaning of being salty by giving the beatitude a compliment. The beatitude is the salt of the earth. Now, one of the things also to keep in mind here is, is in this context, in this, uh, uh, what Jesus is saying is the earth, we're not talking about dirt. Not the salt of the earth, the, the, the dirt, the planet. He's talking about people. The earth reflective of all humanity. This is the context for the beatitude reflected in verses 3 through 12. Now, with this context, we're going to have to reclaim the description of salty because, frankly, this is another thing. Well, i got to be careful here. It is not another thing that the millennials ruin because we love them. Some of us married one of them. Um, we've got, but we do have to, we have to reclaim the term salty. What is salty? How do we get salty? How do we stay salty? What happens if we lose our saltiness? We have to keep in mind that salt, in this context, salt is a vital, vital part of the ancient world. It served a purpose beyond just seasoning food. Salt was used to preserve and to purify. It was used in religious sacrifices and services. It was, it was actually a, a, um, a mineral of great wealth. In some cases and sometimes it was actually more valuable than gold because salt could keep things alive. Interestingly, uh, salt also was used as payment. This is a, a part of you know, American history. Um, World, the, the War of 1812, very, very poor. The United States was very poor, and some of the soldiers, especially in the southern theater of the War of 1812, were actually, they were paid in salt brine. I thought that was interesting. Salt in the ancient world created a barrier that decay could not cross. Now let me show you how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this passage. In in the message paraphrase of scripture, he writes this. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness, and you'll end up in the garbage. This is a good time to remember how we started this series. I talked at length about how this message that Jesus is giving, uh, that we call the Sermon on the Mount, is not about worthiness, but about readiness. It's not about our actions or our work. It's about understanding that Jesus took the action— Jesus did the work. Jesus set the conditions for us to live in that reality. So when we see statements like this, you've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. We need to resist hearing this through the lens of worthiness. When we hear it through the the lens of worthiness, that kind of sucks, right? Like, you're useless and also you're garbage. So don't be that. That would be a, a... a very, uh, that would be a tragic way to read what Jesus is saying. Remember that as we spent the first six weeks of the year unpacking the Beatitudes one by one, we saw this picture emerge of the the person that, that has chosen to allow Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. The person that Jesus is now calling the salt of the earth is the person that chose Jesus to be the worthy one. 
These people, these kingdomized people, the people that we forevermore are going to refer to as the beatitude, are the preservatives of humanity. Without these people, without these people, without the beatitude, without these people, communities will go rancid. If salt is that thing that creates the barrier between life and decay, the beatitude is that person that keeps cultures and communities from going rancid. Without these people, not, not only will life lack flavor, but the decay will be real and complete. This is the use of the church. The collection of the Beatitudes that work together to accomplish the mission that Jesus gave to reflect his image to the world and demonstrate the path to reconciliation with God. This is how we keep the world from going ransom as the Beatitude. But found within this metaphor and the paraphrase that we just read from Peterson is the reality that one can lose their saltiness, which then by extension means that a church can lose its saltiness. How can salt lose the very essence of what it is? There are two ways that this can happen to someone who's heard the gospel message and responded to it to the degree that they begin the process of looking like Jesus. This person can lose their saltiness. I think that can happen through a couple of ways. The first, through being dissolved by culture, and the second, through impurities that make the salt look like another rock, just to be used to pave the road. So impurities first, this is the stuff that competes with Jesus to be the center of order. This is the stuff that competes to get the worship meant for God. This is sin. This is selfishness. It can be unrepentant and habitual sin. It can be activities that make us look more like the culture that surrounds us than the beatitude. It can be selfishness that we're just not willing to surrender in order to see God's will rather than our own will. All of this are the impurities that can take our saltiness. Also being dissolved by culture. And the community around us. Losing our saltiness due to being dissolved by culture and community really is defeat. Now, I don't mean this in a way of, of, like, you didn't play hard enough to win. I don't mean this in a way you did something to lose. I'm talking about just being defeated by circumstance, by culture, by people, and just losing hope. Being overwhelmed by anguish. Overwhelmed by destruction. Overwhelmed by selfishness overwhelmed by helplessness. All of these products of a culture that, that says things like, you do you. A culture that says, like, me first. This, all of this, can make a person just want to quit. If you don't believe me, I, I would challenge you to do this. For one week's time, watch cable news. For one solid week, just watch cable news. And I'm not saying, like, watch, just pick one channel. I don't care what channel it is. Just pick a channel of cable news and watch it all the way through the week. And you will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say being dissolved by hopelessness in our culture. The thing is that, that this reveals is that the road is rough. You know, sometimes we can give in to the lie that following Jesus means that things are going to get easier. And, and in truth, they, they do and they don't. They get easier because they get really, really hard. 
But when we look at this road, especially when we're surrounded by culture that doesn't know the gospel, that rough road sometimes can look impassable. Being dissolved and losing our saltiness is just agreeing with what, with, with, with the worldview of our culture and quitting. This is surrendering, surrendering not to Jesus, but surrendering to the difficulty of the mission. So due to being overcome by impurities or being dissolved by culture, salt can lose its saltiness. And when saltiness is gone, the mission is not possible. It's not a statement of value when Eugene Peterson says that that salt is useless, only fit to be thrown away. It's not a statement of value. It's a presentation of the outcome that we see depending on what we surrender to. Saltiness comes from contact with Jesus. Saltiness is transferred through the gospel and through the process of becoming the beatitude. So how can we maintain our saltiness? I'm glad you asked. I think it starts right here. This is salt maintaining. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us, for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. We are getting salty now. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it, me does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. And we're being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. This is Salty Paul. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power. No power. Yeah. No power. In the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is saltiness. We get salty from contact with Jesus and the love of Jesus that permeates through us into culture is what will keep culture from being rancid. We stay salty when we read these words and we say amen. When we word, read these words and we say yes, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Saltiness is knowing this. Not, not head knowing this. I know that this is not likely the first time that you've seen Romans chapter 8. I didn't mean that to be a joke, but apparently I don't know my audience. It's not knowing this in our head, but it's knowing this in our heart. Allowing this to be the foundation for our thoughts, our actions, and our words. Allowing the love of God to be the reason that we do all of the things that we do all of the time. 
knowing this, too. This is where a lot of times you hear me talk about, like, the church, right? And we come together as a church. You can't do this alone. There is a piece, though, that we have to be able to get this alone before we step into the community to be able to do it together. This is a time where we have to know this alone. Did you know this? Did you know there is nothing you can do that will make God love you more? Did you also know there is nothing that you can do to make God love you less? Do you know that? This is a real question I'm asking you. Do you know that? Is that something that you know or something that we know? This is something that that I struggle with. It blows my mind. It, It blows my mind. This is what happens in heaven. Jesus sitting there. The accuser comes and says to Jesus, you know Sarah? You know the stuff that she's done? Do you know who she really is? Do you know the thoughts that are in her mind? Do you know, do you know all that stuff? And Jesus says, yeah. I know Sarah. Don't you just love Sarah? When people say things about us, about who we are, when the accusations come, I mean, i, I got to own the fact that, that there's a lot of folks can make accusations against me. They're absolutely true. Absolutely true. And when Jesus hears them, he says, yeah, I know Adam. Don't you just love Adam? We hear those words for ourselves. We have to hear those words for ourselves. In your mind, I'd encourage you now to put yourself into that conversation with the accuser calling you out. The accuser saying all of the things that are true, all of the things that are out of context, all of the things, like just all of this stuff, everything that could be put on you. And Jesus, the one that we just read. Nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, angels or demons, fears for today, worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And so Jesus' response is, man, don't you just love them? That's his response when the accusations come. And when we know that, we're salty. Because it's this, it's this love that that cancels out the chaos of life. The love of God demonstrates, demonstrated by the sacrifice of Jesus. Nothing in this world can alter the truth that we are created to be loved. We're created of love. We're chosen out of love. We're called to the Father out of love. We have the invitation to live in right relationship because God loves us. Our usefulness, our usefulness is found in being loved first. And allowing that love to do what love does. It spreads. It multiplies. It grows. It preserves. It purifies It calls humanity into the true identity of the image bearer of the creator God. This is a salt maintainer, the scripture we just looked at, because we know our identity and we can see that identity in those in the time between the Sundays. What I mean by that is that our our saltiness is maintained because we know our identity is loved and we see everyone else as the beloved of Jesus as well. We see them, and we can see them, like we can even see for them that there is a path out of the chaos of their lives. We can see that because we know the way out of chaos in our lives. 
We can guide them on that trail because we know the trail. I don't know about, about you, but I've been on that trail so many dang times. Like I can tell you, I can walk that trail with my eyes closed. I'm not going to trip. I know that trail. We can lead them to the reality also that they are the beloved of Jesus. And we see the salt become the barrier of decay for our community. We can flow from who we are and we can demonstrate a missional reality that the activities of the one that knows that they are loved, that knows that they are forgiven, that knows that they are launched, will serve to keep the community from going ransom, rancid. The effects of the beatitude in the community are these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These effects lead to a response, and in that response, we see the inbreaking of the kingdom of God into the lives around us. Because we're salty. We're salty because he made us salty. We remain salty by holding fast to this reality. Vineyard, we are the beloved of God. We have a mission to salt the humanity where God places us during the time between the Sundays. We stay salty because we know that we're loved. And we can love because we were loved first. So as we turn back to worship, I want to leave you with this reminder of how God's love permeates our life. So would you allow me to read this scripture over you as a prayer? O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything that I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand.